with five seconds. He's going to throw it. Howard leaps. He has it. Touchdown, Carolina. Back from the dead to tie the game with two seconds to go. Snap back, spot down. The kick is cleanly away. It is good. And it's Warner <laughs> with yes, a sir. 54 yard field goal. And how about them Tar Heels? They do it. Here's Kupak. Gives off to Amos. He's, he's good. good. He's, he's good. good. He's good. He's good. He's good. He's good. He's good. He's good. Jordan back to kick, it's blocked again, picked up, it'll be a touchdown Carolina for Gracie Walker. He blocks his second punt and scores his second touchdown of the season, it's 14 to 13. Mr. Jordan beat Mr. Walker. Bernard fields it at the 26, heading to the far side, Gio at the 35, Gio, he's at the 50, no he's not, yes he is, Gio, he's gonna take it for a touchdown. This is the Heel Tough Blog Podcast on Spreaker.com. Hey guys, and welcome in to another edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. It's Anthony Pagnata back with you guys. Zach Hubbard, our recruiting expert, is back with us as well. And we do want to apologize to you guys and to Zach himself. Unfortunately, we did record an episode of the podcast that we just lost. Going to be really honest with you. We thought that we posted it on the website. We did not. We went back. We looked through everything on the computer hard drive, and we also went back and did everything we could to try to recover it through audition and no luck. So, Zach Hubbard is back with us. We did announce that over social media, and we did announce it on that podcast that you guys didn't hear, but he is back with us. He is going to be helping us with a lot of our recruiting stuff, and we have some major Major recruiting news that we do want to get you guys caught up on. Earlier today, four-star defensive tackle Kedrick Bingley-Jones committed to North Carolina. This was something that was somewhat expected over the last couple of weeks, really a couple of months, as the Tar Heels have been making some major progress due to Coach Mack Brown, who Kedrick Bingley-Jones really just latched onto from the first minute that he visited campus, as well as the guy that recruited him in Lonnie Galloway, who now, as we've seen, has done a great job in recruiting the top two players for the Tar Heels in the 2020 class, both of which are defensive linemen. He was also very influential in Miles Murphy's commitment. So, uh, you know, this, this really seems like something that you know, Toriel fans should be excited about Zach. This is a really good young player, a guy that is currently ranked inside the top 200 according to 24-7 Sports, rated as the number 16 defensive tackle. So just a little bit of re- your reaction to landing Kedrick Bingley-Jones on this Saturday morning. Well, this was somewhat expected for a while um, with Kedrick trending to the Tar Heels since earlier this summer, uh, going through his official visit schedule and things along those lines, but did have some stiff competition. Um, his final four were North Carolina, Duke, uh, the Florida Gators, and the Ohio State Buckeyes, and, and the Buckeyes in Ohio really were the top competition uh, for his signature, and you know they've, they've really just been a recruiting force over the last couple of years, as most people will know, so to see him have that sort of you know, elite national interest shows what kind of a player he is, really just shows, you know, the efforts that the Tar Heels went to to get his commitment. Uh, In terms of a sort of how he plays and what his play style is, he's listed at 6'4.5", 266, probably pushing into that 6'5", or even 6'6", range, depending on, you know, who measures him that day, but has a great length, has great body construction, probably can fluctuate that weight up and down in college, maybe not in the, you know, nose guard scenario that we'll see in Jay Bateman's 3-4 defense, but similar to Miles Murphy, will most likely line up in that four-eye defensive end position, really great rushing off the edge, really good setting the edge and run support, just really shows you why he's consistently a top 200 guy, four-star blue chip prospect, um, another one out of, the, out of the Charlotte area there at Providence Day, so really just every aspect of this recruitment shows it as you know another big win for uh, 
the staff, you know, in this cycle and really just another position that they want to continue to build up in, in this recruiting class. Yeah, this was a recruitment that the Tar Heels were behind from in the beginning. Initially, when the Tar Heels' new staff got a hold of Bingley Jones's profile and really started to recruit him, he was committed to Florida and really seemed pretty firmly committed. But Mac Brown and his staff did a great job of changing that mindset, got him to decommit early in the year. I think it was sometime around January. And from there, it just kind of turned into a little bit of a foot race. Florida was still in the running, as you mentioned, also Duke, but they weren't seen as the serious contenders. It was really seen as Carolina and Ohio State, and even towards the end, really just seemed like Carolina had this one wrapped up. They were just kind of waiting for his commitment. Um, I think this is a decision that had been made probably earlier this summer, but Kedrick decided to wait and announce his decision today on August 3rd because this is actually the birthday of his grandmother who passed away when he was eight years old. So this was his way of honoring his grandmother. I don't think anybody can uh, really be angry about that, but this is a decision that was probably made a little bit beforehand. Um, Definitely one that I think nobody in the recruiting world is really all that shocked about. So this is a big pickup for Carolina on the defensive line. Like Zach said, you know, I I like just about everything about his game. He's a real physical pass rusher, very quick off the line of scrimmage, which is something that will help, especially out of the four eye technique where he's probably going to play in this defense. Um, You you said that he doesn't have the size to play nose guard. You're right about that. I don't think he's going to be able to get up to that size. And honestly, they probably won't need him to because that's where Clyde Pender Jr. is more than likely going to play. So they're going to keep him at that strong side defensive end position. That's kind of where I see him. He's listed as a defensive tackle um, you know, through 24-7 sports. I'm not sure if he's listed as a defensive tackle through rivals, but I believe he is on there as well. But he's a guy that really is somewhere around the 270, 265 is probably the lowest he goes, Mark. Now, he might put on a little bit more weight at the college level, but pretty much what I think of him as is basically Jason Strobridge. I watched his film, and that's immediately what I thought about him. A really good pass rusher, a guy that's kind of got a bull in the china shop type of mentality in the, you know, and that's something that you hear mostly with your nose guards, but he's really a guy that isn't afraid of contact. He can take on double teams and is able to get through them. Um, Really does a great job of keeping defenders' hands off of him. That's something that you've got to do as a guy that's going to be on the edge. And one of the other things that you mentioned, and that I don't think a lot of people will probably talk about when they look at his film, is he does a really good job of containing the edge. And that's something that Carolina's defensive ends, they've had a little bit of trouble with over the last couple of seasons. Um, Really, mostly during the Larry Fedora era, a lot of the guys that Butch Davis used to recruit did a really good job of making sure that they could contain the edges and not let running backs get to the outside. So having a guy like Hedrick Bingley Jones there, who is able to, you know, space out that uh, the offensive line and force those running backs to have to cut the ball back towards the middle of the field where there are going to be more defenders is definitely uh, something that is huge for Carolina. Now, I wanted to ask you about this. He does have a teammate in Jacoby Cowan who is seen, I guess, as an Ohio State lean at this point. I think it's very interesting that Bingley Jones was also considering Ohio State but went with Carolina. Do you think that Jacoby Cowan's recruitment could possibly take a turn in the direction for Carolina now that Bingley Jones is committed? Or do you think that basically with the guys that Carolina is looking at, guys like Desmond Evans um, and Jaquarius Conley, uh, do you think that there might just be, uh, there might not be enough space, honestly? Well, I, I certainly think that it will add a different element to it. I mean, I, I would certainly expect uh, Tedrick to reach out uh, to Colby Cohen, sort of see his interest. You know, mm-hmm. through the spring and summer, there wasn't really a lot of talk about uh, Jacoby with uh, Carolina. It was mainly in out-of-state schools, such as Ohio State, as you mentioned. Georgia was a big player there, as mm-hmm. well as Tennessee. So there wasn't really a lot of conversation 
about uh, Jacoby staying in state. Now, that may change going forward as a lot of these other schools are also filling up those spots. But, you know, you're exactly right. Carolina is filling a lot of these defensive line spots. Uh, they currently have four committed of what I would consider to be defensive line prospects and Miles Murphy and Kedrick Dinkley Jones, as we mentioned, mm-hmm. those guard Clyde Penter and then AJ Beatty uh, there in Pennsylvania. So the spots right. are limited. I would say, you know, at most they would add one more and it would probably be on a, you know, first come, first serve basis. Um, not only with Jacoby Cowan, but also with the uh, four star Tonka Hemingway. Uh, I believe he's out of South Carolina, pretty big recruiting battle there with South Carolina. So, you know, as other recruiting guys, uh, such as Don Callahan with um, Inside Carolina with 24-7 Sports, and the rival guys have said, you know, with this defensive line class, they're going to turn guys away. They're going to turn good guys away. Right. Just because, you know, the numbers there are are getting larger and larger. Um, So, you know, that that is something that we're probably going to see in terms of that. But if there's certainly a lot of time to go, uh, it is still very early. So I think the staff is going to you know, keep evaluating their options, keep seeing, you know, who would be the best option there to potentially finish out that class. And, you know, they'll put all their interests in that guy if it comes to it. Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, you know, that that's, that's an interesting mindset to take towards it, the first come, first serve type uh, mindset. But I, I'm, I, I'm not sure if that's exactly how it's going to work. I wonder, you know, at this point... I'm going to tell everyone this, and they need to know this. Desmond Evans, the 2025 star defensive end from Lee County High School in Sanford, North Carolina, is easily the highest recruited player that the Tar Heels have had in this class. Um, It's been consistent throughout since the Tar Heels offered him as a sophomore. Larry Fedora was the guy that jumped on him early and made some early progress. He's talked about that. And Mac Brown and his staff have done a great job of sustaining and building upon that. There will be a spot on this roster for Desmond Evans. So look, if they do take on another one of these guys, like you talked about with Tonka Hemingway, Joe Moore, the defensive end out of St. Louis, uh, who is really looking like he's probably going to be more of a Big Ten lean, um, most probably because the Tar Heels are just so loaded on the defensive line in this class, but um, also due to location, I, Desmond Evans will have a spot on this team no matter what. They might take on another guy. I'm not really... I'm going to be honest. I think they're probably done. That will be interesting is if Evans does not commit to Carolina. Let's say that he does keep it in-state but go to NC State or Duke. Um, There's also some other options. Alabama's trying to get themselves in there, although it seems like he's really trying to focus everything on the in-state schools. There's always a chance that that could happen so Carolina will have to keep some other guys in mind they will have to it's going to be weird they're going to have to try to keep some communication but basically tell these guys look let's delay the decision just a little bit and we'll see if we have room for you but um, everything right now points to Desmond Evans committing to Carolina it's been like that for a while it doesn't seem like there's going to be any momentum shift um, anytime soon Uh, there's no real big time events coming up Uh, of course we'll go in season but Carolina already with uh, you know having sold out of season tickets for uh, the, the entire season there's I think still three games that are not sold out. Miami, I don't think, is sold out as well, but it's very, very close. Keenan Stadium is going to be packed, so the environment is going to be phenomenal. He'll still go to NC State more than likely. That'll probably be an official visit that he'll take at one point. But with Carolina showing signs that everything is moving in the right direction, and you know, depending on you know how this season goes, I think that Desmond Evans is pretty much that close to committing to Carolina. It's just a matter of trying to determine when he's going to make that decision. More than likely, it'll probably be before um, the December signing period. So I'm not sure if it's going to happen in season, when it's going to happen, but I think that as of right now, Carolina will have a five-star committed in this class, and that will probably round out the defensive line class. So, um, but but other than that, you know, I did want to mention this, and I wanted to hear your opinion on this. You know, 
if, if let's say that Desmond Evans does commit to Carolina, that's 23 guys that would be committed in the class. That leaves two spots for what is considered the normal maximum occupancy of a class. Usually after that, you're going to have to look to start cutting guys or uh, but not, not cutting guys, but basically telling them that they have to seek transfer or that they, you know, should look to maybe finish schooling but step away from the football team. There's going to be some some tough decisions made if the Tar Heels do go over 25 in the class. I would say that they probably get to 25 and then stop there. What is your thinking on the number of guys that Carolina will take on in this 2020 class? Yeah, so I did want to clarify that real quick. I was counting uh, Desmond Evans in the sort of the linebacker category. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it is a good point. I mean, he is listed as a weak side defensive end, so he will play sort of that outside linebacker position for Carolina in the 3 4 right. defense, primarily he, as a yeah. pass rusher. But yes, right. the, spot, the spots are limited, and that's the main point. I, they are sitting at 22. Um, and as of right now, you know, if they go over 25, it would really probably only be one guy to a total of 26. So mm-hmm. the spots are limited. My view on that is that I believe that they have two spots that are saved specifically for, you know, two recruits. I think they have one saved for Des Evans, mm-hmm. Des Evans that they're going to save. You know, until he commits somewhere, he's going to have a spot. I would say that the second one is for uh, the four-star safety here in North Carolina, Jaquarius Conley. I think both those guys essentially have a spot saved. Let's say that Carolina gets both those guys. That would bring them up to 24. That leaves one to two spots max. I would probably lean towards, you know, the one, but could go over. Um, And really just at that point, I mean, the staff has to look at what they want to do going forward. I mean, they have some options. Obviously, they could take another wide receiver. Really, the only guy that they have left at that position is Keandre Lambert. So if they feel good about that, that might be their option. There's a few offensive linemen. They might take another one of those. Um, they, they do have you know less options with that. The primary one being three-star offensive guard, Anthony Carter Jr. here in the state. Mm-hmm. Um, if they were able to get another, you know, defensive linemen they might do that or if there was another linebacker that, that came off the board uh, you know if if Trenton Simpson takes another look if there's some other guy that pops up late in the process like right. we saw last year with Eugene Asante that might be it but uh, essentially they have those two spots saved and then a few that are just for whoever else is left but I, I feel like the staff feels really good about the class they have now um, but I think another thing to keep in mind is that you know there could be decommitments in this class. There's decommitments in every class every year. Right. So I, I think a lot of these guys are fairly solid. I wouldn't project any decommitments at this time. I don't think there's anyone that's you know radically looking wrong or anything like that of the guys that are currently committed today. But it, it's certainly not impossible just in this day and age of recruiting. Yeah, I you know I, I think you're spot on with the spots that are left. Um, yeah, Evans definitely has a spot. I think Conley definitely has a spot as well. Um, you know, guys that they could look to add, uh, Anthony Carter Jr. Is, is a very good one uh, that you talked about. He's a guy at offensive tackle that, you know, look, you can never have enough offensive tackles. You're going to lose Charlie Heck after this season. And, you know, we've seen in the past, Carolina does a really good job of taking these guys that are three-star defensive tackles, some four stars, and turn Turning them into all ACC caliber guys, so that that really speaks true on the recruiting trail, and I don't think that Mac Brown is going to change any of that. That's really been going on for a long time. I don't think it's going to change under his tutelage. So, um, yeah, I think that. Anthony Carter is a really good one to look at. Trenton Simpson, like you talked about, I was a guy that when he committed to Auburn, I told people right out, this is not over. This is not a recruitment that's over. And there are people that have talked to him since that have said, you know, he is pretty solidly committed to Auburn, but at the same time, he is still listening to what other schools are saying. He is not a guy that has completely shut down his recruitment. So you never really know. Um, One of the things that I think is going to happen at one point, they need inside linebackers, and there's no one else in this class right now that remains unsigned that is really high on the Tar Heels 
at that inside linebacker position. So I think, very similar to Eugene Asante a year ago, there will be someone, whether or not it's it's sometime during the season or if they're going to wait until after the season and really try to focus on getting that guy in the February signing period, there's going to be an inside linebacker that the Tar Heels are going to focus on because that is a position of weakness. That's a a spot that right now is probably the thinnest on the entire team, maybe besides safety. You can kind of debate there. And, you know, that's another thing with that, that, that will be a, you know, different topic to talk about if Conley decides to go elsewhere, who they would go with there. Um, But, I think inside linebacker is probably going to be that big focus. I think there's somebody that they'll throw an offer to that will jump on it. And, you know, we'll we'll find out who that is later on this season. Now, you mentioned that you didn't think anybody on the current roster would decommit. Josh Downs is a guy that you really got to keep an eye on because he's really just kind of been a very quiet commit for Carolina. He doesn't put out really anything about the Tar Heels on there. Um, Really doesn't seem to put anything about the guys that have committed. Uh, The other day, he did not post any of the official offers. Now, he didn't post any from any of the schools, but he did not post the official offer from Carolina either. He just thanked all the schools that were recruiting him. So, it's starting to feel a little more like he's a guy that could reopen that commitment. I'm not sure whether or not he's going to, if if he does reopen it, take Carolina out of the running because he does have the family connection with Dre Bly. He's been committed there a while and the offense really does fit him well. But don't be shocked if he does reopen that commitment and Penn State, South Carolina, Georgia Tech, a few of these teams that have been trying to get him on campus. Maybe some of them have been able to get it on campus and he's been able to keep it quiet. There have been some rumors that that has been happening, but nothing has been 100% confirmed. Uh, Don't be shocked if those teams make a push for him. Now you were talking about decommitments. Let's talk about Sean Martin's decommitment. Now, of course, Kedrick Bingley Jones's commitment definitely overshadows that. And at this point, really, I mean, you wanted to talk about filling the shoes of a guy that decommits. Well, I think they did more than that by landing Bingley Jones. But Sean Martin was a guy that I remember committed back on June. I think it was June 18th uh, when he committed to Carolina. And, you know, he was a guy that when you threw on the film, you were pretty excited about him. Really athletic player, a guy that could stand up or put his hand in the dirt. So looked like he was going to have that ability to possibly play that rush end if needed or uh, play inside at that four technique. But he ends up decommitting from Carolina. This was kind of a under the radar thing. All the focus was on camp and he really just kind of said on Twitter, I'm reopening my commitment. There was no big decommitment or anything like that. No, uh, I mean, w- wasn't even one of those long typed out letters where he thanks everyone. Really just said, look, I'm, I'm reopening my commitment uh, or my recruitment and uh, we're going to see what's going to happen. It seems like at this point he's probably a West Virginia guy, but what's your thoughts around Sean Martin? I, I think this was certainly something that, like, like you mentioned, was under the radar, but not entirely you know, out of the question just because of the distance. Sean Martin was a guy from the state of Virginia, or sorry, from West Virginia, excuse me. Uh, and, you know, often with guys from that state, they tend to stay a little bit closer to home. We'll say, you know, in state with West Virginia, I might go to uh, schools in Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, but don't tend to, you know, go too far from home. Um, from my understanding, he does have uh, some other teammates or, or people he knows in that area that are being heavily recruited or have committed to West Virginia. So I think there is a little bit of that um, in-state sort of pull to stay home and be the guy for that team. Um, I don't know if he's completely done uh, with North Carolina. I would say no at this time uh, until I see something different or until he commits. But it's certainly something where he is going to take presence elsewhere to West Virginia, uh, probably to uh, a school like Virginia Tech or places like that and still have some interest going into the season. Um, was projected to play at that rush in sort of outside linebacker defensive end hybrid. Mm-hmm. Um, but could have also projected to be one of the four I, you know, traditional defensive ends. So I do think um, that his spot will be replaced as we saw. I mean, we got a commitment from Kedrick Bingley Jones today. 
um, at that in that outside linebacker position. Des Evans is still on the board, so I think right. there's certainly guys that could fill whatever his spot was in this recruiting class. Obviously, he is a big loss, had some nice length, being you know six six two sixty. But I think the Tar Heels will be just fine with the guys that we still have on the board and the guys that we have committed in this recruiting class. The timing is a bit interesting because it. We knew that this was going to be the date for Bingley Jones' commitment for a while. I know that Sean Martin was on campus for the cookout last weekend. Do you think that maybe that was when it kind of set in that, you know, Bingley Jones, I'm assuming at that time, was probably going through at the cookout and maybe telling a couple of guys, hey, this is where I am committing. Do you think that maybe Sean Martin kind of realized at that point, man, there's going to be a lot of guys in this class, uh, you know, maybe I should look elsewhere. I think that's certainly an interesting, you know, point to look at. One that I've also been interested in is the fact that I, the other deep amendment that we've seen in this class so far from four-star quarterback um, Lee Cornsby was coming off a visit in North Carolina. Um, so, you know, both of the commitments are coming off visits. It might have been a situation, now I don't know for certain, and there's not any sort of rumor one way or the other, but it, it's certainly not possible that it was a situation in which the staff is looking over their targets, um, you know, seeing the spots that they have on the board of each given position and sort of, you know, let that player know that it might be best for them to look elsewhere. I, don't, I wouldn't guess so in this scenario. I really liked what I saw from Sean Martin when I met right. the staff do as well, but it's certainly not an impossibility at this point. So it's certainly an interesting angle to it. Um, But like I said, I feel like the targets will be fine with who they have and who they're still targeting going forward. Right, and and that's a possibility. I I just want to make, like, so what I was saying was basically that Martin himself kind of looked around at the group of guys that were there, realizing that, okay, look, we, you know, currently in this class, as you talked about, there are, at the time, three other guys that were committed on the defensive line. Bingley Jones was maybe talking about, you know, maybe was was going around and talking to some of the guys and was saying, yeah, look, this is where I'm committing to. I'm just keeping it silent for right now because I do want to announce on August 3rd because um, you know there there is a little bit of and you know a reason why I chose that date. And then of course Des Evans is there as well and I think you know just we we know how how it works. I mean these guys read all these things as well. So maybe in his own mind, you know, he read something and said it said look, you know, Des Evans is projected to go here and all of a sudden Sean Martin may have just looked around and said, "Wow, there are a lot of guys that are coming in in this class." You know, it's going to be hard to, maybe it's going to be hard to stand out here. And maybe that was just kind of where, you know, he, he kind of made the decision. That's what I was saying. It's also very possible that, like you were saying, maybe that was one of the guys that the staff really had to take a hard look at and say, okay, you know, we might not have enough room for him. I, I mean, you know, you don't really know what, what happened there. Um, it was just, you know, an, an interesting thing to talk about. And, you know, again, we don't want to speculate because we don't know 100%. Um, um, the guys that would would be guys like Don Callahan, who you talked about earlier, who does a great job for Inside Carolina. Um, Gerard Hardy, who does a fantastic job for Tar Heel Illustrated, which is the rival site for North Carolina. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that you know maybe one of those two scenarios is the reason that Sean Martin is now looking elsewhere. And you know, you mentioned that Carolina might not be completely out of the race. Usually with decommitments, you know, it it, it happens where Carolina could stay in the race. We saw it. We saw it with Bingley Jones, a guy that had Florida in his final four. But ultimately, you know, you kind of saw once you decommit, it's it's really hard to go back to a coaching staff and say, "Look, you know, I'm gonna com- I'm gonna commit here once again." Um, you know, usually the only time that happens where a school will see a decommitment and then get that same guy is usually with a coaching change. Um, but you never really know. It has happened before. Um, at this point, I, I would guess that he's probably going to follow where um, one of his friends, the kicker uh, that just committed there, um, I'm blanking on his name right now, uh, goes to the same high school as him at Bluefield in Bluefield, West Virginia. He just committed earlier last week 
uh, to West Virginia. So more than likely, he's going to stay home. That's what most people expect from him. And, you know, I don't think anyone can really blame him, especially looking at what the landscape of the defensive line will look like for Carolina. And with the fact that he does hail from the state of West Virginia, playing for West Virginia is something that is seen as a really big deal there. Of course, we all know that, you know, we've heard that they are still pretty ill about Ryan Switzer coming and playing for Carolina. I'm going to tell you, no one on this podcast is ill about that at all. But um, we wish Sean the best of luck wherever he ends up. And uh, who knows, Carolina could still be recruiting him and he could land back with the Tar Heels before it is all said and done. But there was another commitment earlier in the week. Bingley Joneses will definitely kind of overshadow this one a little bit, but this is one that we do have to talk about, and that's Elijah Green, the three-star running back from Roswell, Georgia. He plays at Blessed Trinity High School. It's a Catholic high school, so he's in the private league, doesn't play against Roswell High School, where we do have two current commitments, but again, it continues to show how well Carolina is recruiting that Atlanta area, but he did commit. Um, It was on... I'm getting my days mixed up here because I was up in New York. Was it, I believe, Tuesday night or Wednesday night? It was, it was, Tuesday, it was Tuesday night. Tuesday night, that's right. Um, yeah, I was out of town up in New York, so my days are all all scrambled up here. But um, he committed on Tuesday night to Carolina. This one uh, w- was interesting because a lot of Tar Heel fans were happy about the commitment, but there was also a little bit of a feeling that maybe there's something going on behind the scenes that we're not seeing because this is the third commit for the Tar Heels in the 2020 class at the running back position. Of course, you've got Green, who just committed, DJ Jones, the running back out of uh, Pine Forest High School out near the Fayetteville area, and then uh, Elijah Burris, the running back from Mount Island Charter in Mount Holly, North Carolina. He's the guy that's been committed to the class for the longest period of time. Um, All three guys are three stars. That's something that's very interesting. Of course, Jones is the highest rated out of all of them. Green, just inside the top 1,000 players. And then Elijah Burris is a guy that's on the outside looking in. Um, You know, and at this point, you know, with three guys in that backfield in the 2020 class, you know, it, it, may, it does make you wonder, you know, maybe if there's something that's going on behind the scenes. What, what was your thinking when you saw his commitment on Tuesday evening? Well, first off, I was glad with his commitment. Elijah was a guy that I really liked uh, as a prospect. Um, has good size at 5'11", 200 pounds, uh, runs a 4'3", 40 yard, 4'2", 5 shuttle. So really have the speed uh, to compete. Plays in a good league in Georgia, playing in 4A in Georgia football there uh, in Roswell, Georgia. So really a good player. But you do look at uh, the fact that Carolina has three running backs in this class. And you do sort of wonder, you know, what what's going on behind the scenes. And there, there's really probably, I would say there's probably two different schools of thought on, on that. Mm-hmm. Um, the first being, um, I would say, the more likely of the two, um, that Carolina could potentially see two running backs uh leaving after this fall. Uh, of course, we see senior Antonio Williams uh, will be leaving the team after this coming season, but the thought at this point is that uh, junior Michael Carter with the season that he would have to potentially get some, you know, NFL interest and right. possibly see, you know, see him declare early uh, and test out the waters there in the NFL. That's sort of the leading theory. Uh, the other would be that, you know, perhaps one of these other guys that you already have might be looking to go elsewhere. Uh, whether it be DJ Jones or Elijah Burris, I tend to lead more towards the former. Uh, DJ Jones and Elijah Burris have both been, you know, pretty solid guys in this class. Right. Burris in particular, um, and Jones has only been committed for a while. Certainly had opportunities to go elsewhere and did not do so. So I would say that the first option uh, would be the more likely um, that Michael Carter. You know, after this season, they have him projected as an NFL guy. They've kind of been more upfront with that. Uh, with prospects on this team as compared to the previous coaching staff. Um, so I think that's the most likely. And then we see, you know, maybe a little bit of a larger backfield next year with a lot of these freshmen, but one that will certainly need some players with uh, the potential for only two returning scholarship running backs. So I think that's sort of what we're looking at at this point. But mm-hmm. it's really just something that we'll have to wait and see how it uh, sort of you know, deals out in the season and going forward, you know, into the next. 
Yeah, I, I think that's probably the mindset that the Tar Heel coaching staff is taking. Um, I don't know if there's anything that is pointing towards Michael Carter leaving. Uh, I know he has the talent, but one of the things that you've got to do as a coach, you've always got to prepare for a worst-case scenario like that. And you mentioned it. Only two scholarship running backs would return then in Javante Williams and uh, Josh Henderson, who will come in, uh, or who is actually... Uh, on campus now, on campus now, yeah. and participating in camp with the Tar Heels. Um, British Brooks is on the roster as well. He saw a little bit of time in the spring game and looked pretty solid, but he's a guy that's not a scholarship player. He's a walk-on. So only having two scholarship players next year is a possibility. That's something that Carolina has to prepare for. So I think that might be one of the reasons why they went in this direction. And, you know, that's helped by the fact that you look at what the roster was supposed to look like. Um, you know, you did lose Devon Lawrence, who was, you know, kind of bouncing all over the place. You remember early in the spring, they were trying to move him to slot receiver. That didn't really work. I think they, you know, it, part of the reason why was because they moved two guys to slot receiver, him and Corey Bell Jr. And, of course, we know about Corey Bell Jr. He's thrived in that role. I think that's one of the reasons why they moved him back. There was also an injury issue with Michael Carter. Carter, of course, in the spring game with his hand. So Devon Lawrence was in the backfield for that game. Unfortunately, when the official roster came out, he was not a part of the team. Now, there hasn't been anything confirmed yet. It's really basically just that he stepped away from the team. They don't really know if he stepped away from football the university. We haven't really had any solid clarification on that, and of course we'll let you know when we do, but that freed up another scholarship spot, and that's, I think, one of the reasons prob- why they look to add another guy in this class. Now, focusing on Elijah Green, this was a guy that, you know, I threw on the tape and, you know, expecting this to be pretty similar to some of our other running backs. He, he's a guy that's pretty impressive. I thought he was definitely a better player than his ranking said. Um, you know, his speed is good, not great, but he's a guy that could be a change of pace in the backfield behind a guy like Javante Williams if the Tar Heels want to go in that direction um, with him, which is definitely a possibility. Uh, he's a guy that, you know, didn't have a ton of catches out of the backfield, um, I, I don't think there were any that were on his highlight tape, and there were none that were listed online, but you would assume that at some point he caught a pass out of the backfield. That's one of the things that we kind of got to know about him, especially with the type of offense that Carolina is going to run. That's a reason why some people think Michael Carter will have a chance to be that successful in this 2019 offense because he can catch the ball out of the backfield so well. But, you know, this is a, a guy in green that has phenomenal acceleration. He hits the hole just about as good as anybody does. Um, And, you know, when he gets through, he's into the second and third level quickly, and he has enough speed to be able to pull away from some of those slower corners and safeties. That's something that's definitely encouraging. You also like the fact that he has the ability to... Uh, make a quick cut and get upfield. Um, he's a multi cut back, so he's a guy that, you know, look, he's not going to put his foot in the ground and run someone over once he finds his lane. He can stop and start in the open field. He makes defenders miss. That's something that I really like about him. Um, now, there is some concern with the fact that he really just hasn't played a whole lot. His statistics are solid, but not phenomenal. He played uh, his freshman year, but was really just a garbage time back. Took over in his sophomore year. That's his best season where he just blew it out of the water. And that's, I think, where he really became the type of prospect that he is right now, which is a three-star running back. Ran for 1,317 yards, 10 touchdowns that season. But came back last year, and unfortunately, his season was cut short due to injury. Only played in six games a year ago. So you wonder you know, whether or not he will be able to get a little more experience as a senior. You hope he can stay healthy and that injuries won't be a big issue for for him, Um, but ultimately this seems like another solid ad in the backfield for the Tar Heels, another guy that, you know, I I think 
can find a role in this Tar Heel backfield. And, you know, as we've seen over the last few seasons, even when the Tar Heels have recruited some of these big-name guys, they haven't always been able to sort of live up to what many people had expectation-wise. So, you know, it's always good to add a good number of running backs in the backfield. You never want to be short on depth in the backfield, especially at a position that currently this season is seen as one of their best. So, um, any any other loose ends that you want to tie up on the recruiting trail? I think just about everything else is uh, pretty quiet as we head into um, the 2019 season. Not projecting any other commitments before the start of the season, but uh, any other notes that you want to throw out there? I did want to say two more things. Uh, one, well, being a little bit of a note on the light and green, you mentioned that he had... Uh, you know, less than impressive numbers in that junior season. Uh, I think the one thing that you know, does make that look a little bit better is the fact that he was sharing carries in the backfield uh, with four, four star Ohio State um, signee Steel Chambers um, that was on the All State team for his region. So there was sort of a split carry, but he did miss some games, only played in seven. Um, so I, I think with Elijah Green, it is important to, you know, sort of wait and see on that senior film, see what he does in sort of that lead back role. Uh, moving on from him, the second thing I wanted to know, we kind of mentioned briefly uh, Jaquarius Conley. Um, I did want to sort of talk about him for a minute. Jaquarius Conley did uh, visit last weekend uh, for the Tar Heels cookout. He's sort of been, you know, throughout um, the spring and early summer, he would make plans to go different places, including Chapel Hill and sort of not show up as sort of a, I would say, lackadaisical look to his recruitment, not really into the recruiting aspect as compared to other guys. But, you know, Showed up in Chapel Hill this past Saturday. Um, really had a great time. But his father, which is kind of the sort of the lead uh, family member in his uh, recruitment, and really just had a ton of great things to say about Carolina. Uh, even going so far as to say that Carolina, you know, has pushed itself to the top of the board uh, in terms of his recruitment. Now, earlier in the spring, said that he probably would like to get his commitment out of the way before the season starts. I would not say that that's still the case. Uh, just based on how he's, you know, gone about his recruitment so far, I wouldn't hold that down as sort of a, you know, definitive. It is good that Carolina was able to get him on campus um, and really get, you know, some, some more one-on-one time with him. He is, I would say, the primary target outside of Des Evans to finish off the class, as I mentioned earlier. But, you know, this may be a recruitment that we say go into the fall um, and, you know, potentially into the early signing period or even the late signing period. Um Chris Connolly is just a guy that's not that interested. He just wants to play football, plain and simple. So it's one that we'll keep monitoring, but I, it is one where you know the Tar Heels feel like they have a good shot at this point. Yeah, you know, I wonder whether or not that visit to Carolina sort of changed things because South Carolina was in the lead for him. And I, I wonder if, you know, he doesn't take that visit, maybe if he does commit before the season starts, but I think now he does have some things to think over. Um, but yeah, we'll keep you updated on all that, all everything on Des Evans and everything on the Tar Heel recruiting trail on the Heel Tough Blog website, heeltoughblog.com. Uh, under the recruiting tab, that's where we have everything recruiting. And then, of course, right here on the Heel Tough Blog podcast when we do these recruiting podcasts. Hey, Zach, great stuff, man. Love having you back with me. Uh, it's been fantastic. I hate that we weren't able to put that other episode up. Again, we had no idea what happened to it. But this one, we are definitely getting up. This one is going to go up right after we conclude it here so that we can get it out to you guys. So, uh, yeah, man. Hey, thanks for joining me. Um, and, yeah, this. This, this has been phenomenal. Tell people a little bit about um, the, one of the things that you got going on a little bit separate from us. I know that you um, are kind of talking about some of the aspects of the 2019 team on your Twitter. Um, so, if you, you know, h- how can people check that out? Yeah, so every Wednesday or Thursday, it's kind of a sort of free-floating thing that I've decided I'm going to do, it's sort of a thread on a different aspect of the team. This past week, I did one on the offensive side of the ball, so looking over you know, the various positional outlooks. Um, so if you want to follow me there, you can follow me on Twitter. It's at HackZubbard2. Um, just follow me there. It's free for discussion, so if anyone has any comments or concerns or wants to argue, even <laughs> that's certainly fine. I mean, we're always down for discussion. I think that's one of the key things that we want to do here is keep it very open, right. you know, to the fan base um, to participate and you know to have that sort of um, community that Chapel Hill and uh, 
the University of North Carolina is known for. So, yeah, go check it out. Go look for it in the coming weeks. Uh, next week I'll be doing sort of the defensive side of the ball, moving forward into scheme, coaching staff, and then maybe even in the season. I don't have any definitive plans on that, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Come, uh, come the season, come games rolling around, um, we'll see what happens with that. Should be a very intriguing 2019 season, and uh, you guys can check that out, again, at HackZubber2 on Twitter. All right, man, we'll uh, talk to you down the line. There should be some recruiting news that will come out during the season, so whenever we get enough recruiting news to where we think that we can put together a podcast for you we'll be back to do that hey take care man and uh we'll you know if if we i don't talk to you on the podcast i'll talk to you before the season and we can talk a little bit about the 2019 tar heels okay man all right that sounds good all righty so that is zach hubbard uh, who is back with us? Who is back with us? Uh, right here on the Heel Tough Blog podcast. Now we are going to have a pretty quick turnaround. This podcast will come out today. Later tonight, we will be recording a podcast for the bold predictions for the 2019 season. So, Zach is our recruiting expert that we have with us. And then, of course, we have our usual co host, Josh Marlowe, who will be with us. Uh, Later on this evening, he'll be giving us his bold predictions. I'll give you my bold predictions. And we want to hear from you guys. Send us your bold predictions because we want to read those on the air. We want to read everything that you guys think about this Tar Heel football team. Be bold with them. Be bold with them. Trust me, there are some really bold takes about this team already, whether it's good or bad. Um, But we want to hear what you think. We want to hear where you think this Tar Heel team is going to be at. And of course, we will be helping you get ready ready for the Tar Heel football season on the Heel Tough blog podcast each week. We're going to do different aspects. Um, So yeah, we'll have the bold predictions this week, next week. um, We're we're closing in. We're getting pretty close. So I'm not sure whether or not we'll go with the in-depth schedule breakdown or if we'll go with something different. Um, But one of the two we'll do uh, pretty much like with the in-depth schedule breakdown, We'll, we'll kind of go game by game. We might also kind of do a little list where we kind of tell you uh, each game from easiest to toughest and kind of rank those games there. There's a couple of different things that we're kind of messing around with there, um, but that should be a really fun podcast for you guys. And then, of course, remember that we will not give you our official predictions for the South Carolina game until... We go out to Moo and Brew in Charlotte the day of the game. That's right, Moo and Brew in Charlotte. We are hosting a live podcast out there. You guys can come and see us and a couple of Tar Heel guests as we break down the Tar Heels game against South Carolina and the 2019 season. It's at Moo and Brew Restaurant in Charlotte, home of the Charlotte version of the Blue Cup. Come in there, get your Blue Cup, watch us talk a little bit of Tar Heel football. We'll have some guests out there with us. Ryan Houston is going to be out there with us, the former Tar Heel running back. There's a chance that Mark May might be out there with us. It just depends on what's going on, of course, with his son Drake. But if he's out there, he's going to stop by the former Tar Heel quarterback. So we have some great guests that we're trying to get lined up for you guys to put together a fantastic show out at 1300 Central Avenue in Charlotte. That is the location. Show will start at 11 a.m. We'll finish up around 1 a.m. so that you guys can go finish up your tailgate and then head to the stadium to watch the Tar Heels face off against the Gamecocks as they open what is one of the most anticipated 2000 or one of the most anticipated football seasons in Tar Heel football history. Um, I also remember guys, the place for all of these major things is on heeltoughblog.com. You can get everything. That's right. You can get the articles that are written. Right now, we got one up about Kedrick Bingley Jones. We have one about the decommitment from Sean Martin. But we're not just all recruiting. We also have what is my favorite thing to write every single year. It is the position previews, the in-depth position previews, where we look at each position group and we tell you about every single guy that is on the roster. Even the walk-ons tell you where we expect them to be at, and we also project the depth chart. Quarterback is up right now, and I'm going to tell you, it took me a while to determine just what the depth chart was going to look like 
for those three quarterbacks. I bounced back and forth uh, really between the second and third guy on the depth chart, kind of switching those two back and forth. I actually did that three or four times before I finally just went with my gut instinct on that one. So go online, check that out. HeelToughBlog.com is where you can check that out. Of course, the podcast is under there. Just go to the podcast tab. And you can check out all the episodes of the podcast. We've got some fantastic stuff on there. We've got our breakout players for the 2019 season. That's the episode just prior to this, episode 97. Josh and me give you our breakout players for the 2019 season. And, of course, plenty of other great stuff you want to go back. Um, we do have Joe Serrera of the Greensboro News and Observer on there. Or News at Greensboro News and Record, excuse me. Greensboro News and Record on there as he talks about uh, Miles Murphy's commitment. So you can go back, read, and listen to all that stuff so that you can make sure that you're ready for the Tar Heels 2019 season and the Tar Heels 2020 recruiting class. So, I want to thank Zach once again for joining me. Of course, he is back full-time with us doing recruiting, so uh, we are so glad to have him back, and we think he's going to bring some great expertise to the table. And of course, we want to thank you guys for listening, and as always, Go Tar Heels! Go Tar Heels!